Uh, I'm Dick Kell, Chair of the Warren Centre Humanitarian Engineering Hub and your moderator for the uh, this morning, uh, for this morning's uh, webinar. I'll, I shall start by acknowledging the traditional owners uh, of the land where we meet, wherever that may be, and by paying our respects to our First Nations peoples and their leaders past, present and emerging whilst recognising and celebrating their history, culture and achievements. I welcome you to this uh, webinar, which has been organised, of course, by the uh, Warren Centre Humanitarian Engineering Hub. The Hub has been established to provide a forum for the promotion of humanitarian engineering within the context of international development and uh, disaster relief. The webinar this morning, of course, is in that latter category and I welcome you all to join. The rules are um, simple. I remind you that this event is being recorded and our schedule has some time for questions. Please make use of the Q&A function to pose your questions and the speakers will address as many as they can. And please keep your questions and comments as concise as possible. On the 15th of uh, January this year, the Pacific Island country of Tonga was seriously impacted by a major undersea volcanic eruption and consequent tsunami and ash plume. It was tragic, but perhaps fortunate that only three lives were lost in such a major disaster. But there was widespread damage to infrastructure and to agriculture and to the lives of the people of Tonga the undersea communications cable was fractured and the ash cloud banked out uh, the, um, the internet and uh, communications. Tongan Prime Minister Siosi Savalini described the event as an unprecedented disaster. And it clearly was, he was correct. What was remarkable in the aftermath was the rapidity with which the World Bank Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery, the GFDRR, mobilised to investigate the damage together with, they investigated together with the Tongan government and provided the detailed report necessary as a basis for the rehabilitation works. And, and also what was remarkable was the speed with which the submarine cable specialists moved to identify the problem and restore communications. These actions were world's best practice and minimise the impacts on the people of Tonga. Uh, we can and should certainly learn from what was done following the disaster. And we have the opportunity to do that this morning. Uh, the link to the GFDR report, the, report, the grade report, has been provided to those who are registered and will be in the chat. And today we have four outstanding speakers who are front and centre in the immediate post-disaster actions and can inform us and, uh, on what was done. And I'll introduce the first two of these, the GFDR speakers, briefly now so that they can speak. And then I will uh, turn to the people involved with the, the cable. Firstly, Dr. Rashmin Gunasukara is a senior disaster risk management specialist and leads the global program for disaster risk analytics at GFDRR at the World Bank in Washington, DC. Rashmin has joined us from Washington this morning. He has developed several innovative products and operations in disaster risk management and in disaster risk financing. Uh, he has over 15 years of uh, experience uh, beyond the, the working for the bank uh, um, in extending in the public sector, reinsurance industry and uh, in academia. Uh, Rashman has a PhD in earthquake seismology and has an honorary lectureship at the University College London. Our second speaker on this subject is Dr. James Daniel. He is John, uh, James is a John Monash scholar and a geophysicist, geologist and civil engineer specialising in global stochastic and real-time modelling for insurance and governments as well as global data analytics. Uh, John uh, has a, a, a degree in um, uh, uh, 
from uh, KIT in Germany uh, in, in masters in earthquake engineering and uh, seismology, as well as his um, engineering and, and BSc from uh, the University of Adelaide. So I will now invite um, Rashvin and James to um, address us uh, on the, um, the work that the uh, GFDRR did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's a real pleasure to be connected uh, this morning. Uh, I hope you could uh, see the slides. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, this particular uh, short presentation is actually going to focus more on uh, the grade approach and uh, Richard kind of briefly explained uh, what it is. In the next 25 minutes or so, we would first describe what grade is and then go on to talk about the importance of it and then particularly the case of Tonga and, and what we actually did. So we'd also show a, a particular video relating to, to, to the Tonga volcanic eruption as well as the grade assessment itself. So GRADE basically stands for the Global Rapid Damage Estimation Work. And this was really because we see uh, um, even after most disasters, particularly in small island development states, there are many questions the governments need urgent answers to. These include how do we actually assess damages? Where are the damages distributed? And what is the socioeconomic impact associated with it? The field-based um, evidence and, and the associated damage assessment usually takes about two months to conduct. This becomes increasingly difficult during the COVID-19 context when it was actually very hard to go onto the ground and become impossible in the case of Tonga when the government actually came up with a contactless aid approach where the government of Tonga itself said, okay, we need to minimize the amount of contact with, with foreign nationals coming in to provide some of the support. Therefore, the great estimate or the great methodology was specifically requested by the government of Tonga to conduct this type of analysis. And we do this using a lot of disruptive technology. We use, for example, satellite data. We use uh, remote uh, sensing data, including social media data sets, as well as drone footage. We also use engineering data sets, as well as socioeconomic data sets to develop an estimate of the physical damage associated with the particular disaster within two weeks. But what has been done before this? For example, there are quick but less detailed assessments that are actually being done. These include, uh, for example, for USGS that has the pager for earthquakes that provide estimates quickly around the world, but also there are risk modeling companies like RMS or AIR, but they mainly concentrate on more developed economies as well. There are also satellite studies like Dunasat that actually provide information and also relief web. There are also the insurance industry that provide less detail because it's proprietary information, but slower as well. Then there are the government institutions that provide some of these damage estimates. These include research and universities. They tend to be very detailed, but then can be a few months down the line. That means there's a significant gap for more detailed but quicker damage estimates. That's where the World Bank grade approach comes in. In this case, since 2015, we have conducted 37 grade assessments. However, since the pandemic where restrictions were limited, we contacted or conducted 20 of these 37 grade assessments. That means we have been very, very busy in the last three weeks, uh, both James and me and, and, and the rest of the team. But this really meant that uh, day and night where they were inundated with requests to look at damage estimates from, from uh, cyclones in, in, in Africa region to, to the Latin American Caribbean region, but also to the Pacific region as well. And what this really meant again was in the case of the Tonga volcanic eruption, 
the government already had confidence on these grid estimates because we were not only able to provide these estimates, for example, to um, within two weeks time frame, but they were almost to 80 to 90% accurate to the detailed damage estimates that came the months after that I actually highlighted before. So in the case of um, the Tonga volcanic eruption, there were residential building damages that we actually uh, modeled also non-residential building damages as well as some of the infrastructure and agricultural damage. In Tonga Tapu, which is the main island, we saw that the non-resident building damage was actually very, very significant. But a key portion was also in the agriculture side. The agriculture side, most of it was related to volcanic impacts, while for infrastructure and non-residential side, it was more related to kind of the tsunami impact. But there was also ash cleanup cost the government actually wanted. We worked very much in tandem with the ministries of finance and other line ministries in developing these damage estimates. So it wasn't just a remote damage estimate itself, but it was an iterative process of getting feedback of, from, from the government. And as we can hear from the other speakers, this became even more challenging because of the lack of telecommunications with the cable being cut. And in to put you uh, in this particular damage in particular context, we realized that there were significant portions uh, equivalent to the impact of the D GDP. And this was like over 5% for non-residential buildings, but also over 4% for kind of the infrastructure. These are huge impacts on the GDP. Um, maybe I can just show the, the video, James, and, and then you can get onto this slide. Yep, sounds good, sounds good. So we produced a video as well for, um, for the government as well as um, external people to understand a little bit about um, the, uh, the assessment that we've done, um, but also just to get a very quick context of where damage was around, around the place. And so this is the video that we produced for it. Welcome so, to the Great Assessment for Tonga. Now, the Tongan eruption caused two things, volcanic ash fall and also tsunami. And both of them affected different islands around Tonga. Now, we see here how Pai and the closest islands affected. Here, the tsunami wave was very, very high. Um, and so we saw nearly every structure on Mango um, Island um, with catastrophic damage. Now, on Funafuya Island as well, we saw nearly all buildings um, destroyed, save two, um, and significant damage on, on those structures that remained. Moving off to Namuka, um, here we also saw catastrophic damage from the tsunami itself, where we see the shoreline um, and most of the buildings close to the shoreline um, have, um, down to the foundations, as well as damage inland. We also saw a significant volcanic, volcanic ash fall here, which of course also affects crops and um, in infrastructure as well. Moving down um, closer to uh, Nukwa Lofa, um, down onto Tonga Tapu, um, we see towards the north and uh, north um, and coast of Nukwa Lofa, we see all damage to the ports. Um, also, we saw flooding damage uh, coming inland, um, as well as significant damage along, along the coastline. Now, this has a combination of infrastructure damage as well as some damage to structures as well. Um, we saw minor damage along the seawall, um, but also then damage inland, of course, to commercial as well as residential structures. Moving further across to the east, we also saw significant damage at the ports. Um, as well as in certain buildings around, um, around here as well. However, um, we really saw a lot of damage uh, towards the west and less damage towards the southeast. Moving down to the international airport, um, here we saw volcanic ash fall on, uh, at the airport itself. However, apart from this, the runway uh, didn't have much damage. Further down south, however, we saw of course, tsunami effects, again, uh, causing damage to the resorts down there. 
Moving back towards the northwest, we saw damage um, again resulting from the tsunami um, along the northwest coast, and then the worst affected area was along the western coast. Here there are lots and lots of resorts as well as many residential structures. Now these resorts on the western coast were damaged in Harold in 2020. However, here we saw even higher wave action uh, in most cases, causing catastrophic damage um, down, mostly down to the foundations as well along the coastline. Um, most of these buildings are now are completely destroyed and would need to be rebuilt. Now, um, we have Dr. Latu's um, video here. Here we see a drive along here for our road and uh, we see the, the wave coming inland. We also see volcanic ash fall damage. Um, so there's significant damage to structures also along this road. Now the resorts to the west are being completely destroyed. These ones along the road, there are some uh, which are which will probably be completely damaged and will have to be um, torn down and rebuilt. And then there are some with, with flooding damage, um, which will also cause problems. Now along here also the infrastructure um, has been uh, damaged, the roads, um, as well as water supply. Moving to Atata At At Island, uh, this was also one location that was significantly affected by the tsunami. The tsunami washed across and knocked out uh, most of the resort, as well as a lot of the structures along, along this, uh, this stretch of land. Here we see the NZDF um, uh, picture as well as UNITAR, where we see that um, about 75% of buildings are uh, destroyed and, and, and the rest are, are significantly damaged. Um, there may be a couple of structures that are able um, to, um, to, to get away with minor damage. Here we see Pangamoto Island, again a resort island where we also saw significant damage from the, from the tsunami. Fafa Island as well saw damage from the tsunami as well. Some structures were reported gone, others with volcanic ash fall as well as then uh, problems. Moving across to Uar Island, here we saw again the tsunami wave cause major problems along the coast. Um, there are at least 100 damaged um, houses as well as uh, structures here. Um, and these Again, uh, also problems with agriculture due to volcanic ash fall, as well as the infrastructure and the wharf along there. Moving to the rest of Ha'apai, we also, um, moving to the north, we see limited damage on the rest of the islands. On Lefuka Island, there was some damage, again, due to the tsunami, limited damage due to the ash fall, um, as well as some uh, um, damage to some of the islands a little bit closer in. But the major damage was on Mango, Funafua, and Nawuka. Now, if we zoom out, we see Tonga. And Tonga is built in Tonga Trench to the east, which has major earthquake tsunami problems. And then, of course, we have 17 active volcanoes, um, of which all um, can, can cause issues for Tonga. Coming to the damages, we see the damages here from top, um, for residential buildings, non-residential buildings, infrastructure, agriculture, forestry, and fishing, and split across Tonga Tapu, Ha'apai, and Hua. The, with the submarine cable as well, there are significant damage costs associated with this, as well as with ash cleanup costs. Now, this damage, these damage estimates a lot of the damage for the non-residential buildings on Tonga Tapu are in the resort sector. And we also see significant damage due to volcanic ash fall uh, in the agriculture as well as infrastructure portions. Thank you very much. Um, I hope this gives you a quick insight into uh, the damage that has occurred in Tonga. Okay, so um, that was the video that we used to sort of um, introduce and hopefully that gives you a, a very quick overview for all of us that have probably for, um, forgotten a little bit of uh, what had actually happened during the event. Now, of course, in the media, um, the worst pictures are shown, of course. Um, the, everything looks that it's, a, that it's uh, a complete catastrophe, that everything is destroyed. Of course, on certain islands, this was the case, but there was also a lot of undamaged um, structures and and it's just as important to work out whether um, 
where there are undamaged structures as damaged structures when doing a loss assessment. Now, as I said in the in the video, um, Tom. Tongra is very, very vulnerable to, to a lot of different um, natural hazards. It's not just um, volcanic eruptions, of course. We expect large earthquakes, um, but also um, various other um, disaster types. Now, in terms of the amount of structures on, on Tongra, it affected um, reasonably few um, in terms of you know, catastrophic failure of structures. Um, of course, the tsunami on the western side, as, as was said, um, of, of Tonga Tapu, um, there there was significant damage, but and also down in Yua as well. And of course, a few islands on Ha'apai. Um, but other than that, there was just a lot of very light volcanic um, ashfall, which of course then was more of a problem for the infrastructure rather than um, so infrastructure like roads, transport, water supply, power, rather than um, the, the, um, the, the buildings themselves. Um, next slide, please, um, Rashmi. So we produced also this report and hopefully um, you've had a chance to have a look at it. Otherwise, please, please do have a look at it um, afterwards. And also there's also some frequently asked questions and things like this. This is produced uh, generally two weeks to three weeks after, after these events. And so, of course, the, the information has now changed, but uh, this was our best, uh, our best effort um, with this short time period. Um, next slide, um, please. Okay, so what are the key findings? So the economic damage of 90 million, of course, from global standards is not a huge amount, but for Tonga, of course, this is, this is a lot. Um, the impact on capital, it's a, approximately about 2% of, um, of the capital. Um, so the, the building's infrastructure um, that has been, uh, that was destroyed. Um, and this damage is very uneven across the islands. So this, this obviously causes differences um, depending on where you are. Um, the economic damage was mostly concentrated still in Tonga Tapu simply because of the amount of exposure there. Um, and that western side as well for, for, for tourism is extremely important. And, um, and there, it wasn't just this event where they've been affected, they've been affected in, in Harold as well, um, slightly in Gita. Um, but um, this is uh, sort of some of these resorts have had three disasters inside of, um, inside of four years. And so that combined with the added uh, impact from, from Corona, um, then has definitely sort of, um, it's definitely uh, was a big, big problem. Um, in terms of the volcanic impact versus the tsunami impact on agriculture, um, this is where also there's this unevenness between the, the disaster type as such, or the, the peril type, and the, the impact, because um, about 80% of the damage was attributable to volcanic impact for agriculture, whereas 20% due to tsunami. And we see that this had economic damages in about the order of, of Gita as well as Harold, um, despite, of course, the, um, uh, the, the large impact in different locations. Again, uh, these other tropical cyclones, uh, or these tropical cyclones also had around about the same order of damages. And next slide, please. So in terms of infrastructure, it really was a, co a combination of tsunami and volcanic ash fall. We, we generally see this in, in, um, in disaster types as well, that the infrastructure is generally more vulnerable um, to, to volcanic ash fall, um, simply because uh, of, of how the components are. Um, once you get up to very high ash fall, uh, then you can start having problems for structures, uh, buildings. But in this case, the, the ash fall wasn't large enough uh, or wasn't great enough to, to cause major problems for structures. Um, in terms of the agricultural damage, um, there were moderate depths of ash um, compared to other volcanic eruptions around the world, 15 to 30 millimetres. And Luckily, depend, uh, de it, depending on the, the season, and of course, Tonga has very, various seasons for, for, their, um, for their different produce. Um, the damage, of course, was high, but um, they're also reasonably resilient as well. Um, there were some cash crops that were affected, but it, or it wasn't uh, as much of a, a issue as we, were, we, had, um, we had first feared, also because of the, the type of um, chemical makeup of the ash fall. 
Um, in terms of residential buildings, um, this was about half of the estimated damage to non-residential buildings, mainly because of the tourism impact. And these tourism assets, of course, require not only the rebuilding of the structures, but also the land, the walkways, the moorings, as, uh, as well as the infrastructure and facilities. And uh, of course, there was significant damage to the waterfront uh, in Nukolofa. Um, and this, of course, uh, when you move towards recovery and reconstruction, then this is obviously um, uh, dominates this, again, being, being cent a central point of Tonga. Next uh, slide, please. Okay, so when we are looking at um, doing these assessments, it's really three main components. The hazard, which is, of course, you know, what is your depth of ash fall? What is the wave height? Uh, what is the wave action? Um, then it's the exposure, what the, the amount of people, the, um, the dollars, uh, the type of structures that are sitting there. And then it's the vulnerability of this to that hazard. So depending on that wave height, depending on the damage that we see, um, what, you know, what percentage of damage is actually occurring to that structure. Now, this can be ascertained in many different ways. There are a lot of studies that have been done previously, which give these, these estimates. But there are, also, um, there are also then certain other ways that you can ascertain damage. Of course, usually you would go out and do a, a damage assessment. Uh, again, because of Corona this, at the moment or um, previously as well, it, it, it's problematic doing these on, uh, on site assessments now. So we, we need to do this through either drone imagery, um, through the, the Air Force um, imagery, as well as then through social media and to ascertain uh, what the percentage of loss of those structures are. Of course, at certain places you don't have data and this is where you need to move back towards engineering damage estimation approaches, um, which uh, are done for risk assessments usually. Next slide, please. So um, depending on the different type of, um, of uh, structure, you can have very, very different, um, different uh, damage percentages um, based on, say, volcanic ashfall. And this, these here are from um, just different vulnerability functions. I don't want to get into it too much. Um, but depending on that depth of ash, you can have a very, very different uh, you know, percentage loss. So this is for buildings. And then we also have for agriculture. And of course, then you may see a loss of 50% of the crops just through, um, through five millimeters of ash, depending on, uh, depending on that, um, the, the acidity of the ash, as well as other, as, as well as other um, sort of um, conditions. And then for infrastructure, it's the same sort of thing, depending on what the cleanup, depending on uh, what, what it does to, to the different structures and how long it sits on the ground, you can have very, very different damages that occur to that same structure. And this is done through things called vulnerability functions. And a lot of, obviously a lot of research is done around the world for different, uh, for different volcanic eruptions around. And next slide. So we use a huge amount of data within GRADE uh, and anything we can get our hands on uh, is used for the assessment. So we do a lot of sort of building of the baseline or the exposure, and this is built through, through open data that, that um, is generally on geo nodes or land cover data sets, census data, survey data pre-event. Pre and we also then look at the historic disasters because they give us a good, uh, a good opportunity to assess the vulnerability of the, of the different components as well as ascertain the value of the, of the, um, of the infrastructure. We then combine this with on-site social media reports um, so we had government ministers tweeting these videos that you saw and pictures were, uh, were often from people who were, who were um, just posting their pictures on, online um, and then talking to them, as well as then some of the Air Force flyovers, which are extremely important this time um, to, to, to ascertain some of the remote damage, because again, telecommunications were down and we had these problems. And so um, to get at this information, to get an assessment of the disaster, this is the only way that it could, could have been done in this case. But there is a lot of, obviously a huge amount of data which goes into these assessments. Next slide, please. Okay, I'll hand you back, Rashmi. Mm. Thanks, thanks, James. So this is our last slide, and this kind of really highlight what is the impact of what GRID has been doing. So in the case of Tonga, the, as I said, the government actually used as the, this GRID report as the official damage estimate that really, help the government 
develop their response plans. So we were also part of advising on how to develop their response plans as part of our technical assistance work with the government, but also uh, it also influenced some of the financing, but also some of the donor coordination between the multilateral uh, IFIs as well, and also some of the donor countries as well. But this really highlighted kind of some of the needs for national as well as regional capacity building as well. And that's where three parts of academic, public and private sector collaborations for open data and knowledge sharing becomes important. Capacity building on grade within the national and DRM institutions, as well as kind of the strengthening of use of dynamic and disruptive technology becomes very, very important. And this really helps us to strengthen and to develop a, more, a better and a resilient world into the future. Thanks. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Rashan and James, for uh, a most interesting and informative uh, presentation there on grade. Uh, we do have um, some questions starting and we'll deal with those uh, after we've heard our next speakers. Um, so um, please uh, put your questions on the, um, uh, the Q&A and uh, we'll uh, get to them. And, and I'll, I'll now uh, introduce, we thought we'd take all the questions together at the end. So we will now have the, our speakers on the two speakers on the submarine cable and the communications. Uh, our speakers today are uh, John Hibbard, who is uh, an engineer and uh, has worked for in the telecommunications industry for over 40 years and, um, and a great deal of that associated with the uh, submarine cables. Uh, he worked for much of his career with Telstra. Um, he was managing director of Global Wholesale. Uh, but he, uh, since uh, becoming an independent uh, consultant 20 years ago, he, he's been involved uh, with a great deal of uh, development of the international submarine cables across the Pacific and is very knowledgeable in those, those areas and, of course, is a member of the Pacific Telecommunications Congress. John uh, Turnbull leads SES uh, Satellites Australia and Pacific Efforts. He has more than 30 years experience in the telecommunications industry also in Australia and internationally, specialising in connectivity solutions uh, in, in involving uh, submarine uh, cables. And he has an MBA uh, from the Australian Institute of Business. So I will now invite uh, John Hibbard to start off on the, um, uh, the Tongan cables. Thank you, John. Thank you, Dick, and thank you for that introduction and good morning, everyone. Um, as Dick said, I've been consulting in the Pacific Ocean region, uh, particularly in the submarine, in the submarine cables for, for some 20 years or more and uh, involved with international telecommunications for, for 40. So uh, let me uh, share my slides and I will go to here and yeah okay um let's go that's just the intro slide so we'll go to the next one the pacific ocean oh, sorry excuse me my my little notes went right off at the time <laughs> Sorry, I'll be on you a moment. You couldn't believe it. I had them hitting. Here we go. Um, the Pacific Ocean's got many submarine cables, and there's some of them shown on the slide. And of course, the one of particular importance is the one between Tonga and Fiji, and uh, and so that's what we'll be really addressing. Um, the cables some 827 kilometres long, and it goes through a a, a depth of up to 4,000 metres as it transverses that, that route. Also, Tonga has a, a, a domestic cable which runs from uh, Nuku'alofa via Hapai up to uh, Vavau. Um, 
the international cables basically carrying some in excess of 90% of the, the Tonga communication. So a failure of the cable clearly creates a massive disruption to communications from Tonga. And uh, that was experienced during the, during the uh, volcano and the subsequent impact. Um, from uh, from nineteen uh, from two thousand to ten to two thousand and thirteen, I was involved with the development of the the Tonga Fiji cable, and uh, that that was a, a significant effort. And the single biggest issue in this planning process for that cable was finding a way through the myriad of hydrothermal vents that are the north and northwest of of uh, Tonga Tapu and Nukulofa. It was quite a challenge to, to thread the cable through there, keeping enough distance from them and, uh, and allowing them to, uh, the cable to have the security. There's a lot of experience with handling hydrothermal vents and uh, the distances that you can, should keep away from is about 500 meters from the vents. And sometimes when the, they're very close together, it's pretty hard to meet that target. However, we found a way through and uh, it had been operating satisfactorily until the, until this earthquake, uh, until this, rather, this volcano created the, uh, all of the, the issues associated with the, the lava flows and that, and that caused a, a break in the cable. Um, so when it exploded in, uh, in January, 15th of January, service to Tonga was clearly interrupted and uh, both on the international cable and on the domestic cable. And, uh, and once, the, uh, once that happened and once we confirmed that there was, there was a break, uh, just to make sure there wasn't a false alarm, um, the cable ship was, uh, was called out um, to do the, undertake the maintenance and undertake and make the repair. Here's a picture of uh, the, the CS Reliance, which is the cable ship that was, was used. Um, the cable ship at the time was in Port Moresby and it was on its way to Cocos Island to, uh, to do, do some a cable lay into Cocos. And of course, under the maintenance agreement um, that uh, all the cable owners have, including Tonga Cable with, um, with Subcom, who is the current provider, um, the cable ship has to drop what it's doing and come and make the repair. So the ship left uh, Port Moresby on after sort of preparing for the, the change of plan um, on the 18th of, of January, three days after the volcano and arrived on site off, off Tongatapu on the uh, 26th of January. The process was to find the the leg of the cable which was coming out of T Tonga out and, um, and to see how far that went and pick it up, which they did within three days and they buoyed it off and it was some 37 kilometres from, from Nuku'alofa where the end of the cable was found. The next step is to go to the other end and start looking for the, the leg from Fiji and clearly you want as much as you can so they, they started relatively as close as reasonable to the volcano area and then start looking for it there. And the process here is to uh, basically use a grapnel. You uh, put the grapnel over the side, um, which is a great big series of hooks and you drag it across the bottom and hopefully you grab the cable and the guys on the ship are so experienced that they know when they've got one. And, uh, and then they, they lift it up. Well, they lifted up some pieces which were actually individual pieces because it had been severed in several places. Eventually, they found the, found the point um, where they could actually communicate back to Fiji. And, uh, and so from that point of view, they, they knew that they had a good leg north and a good leg south. But unfortunately, there's a gap of some 90 kilometres between the two. Um, in that gap was one of the repeaters. The repeater is the submarine cable amplifier that's about every 100 kilometres along the cable and that was lost and could not be found. So that has been, will have to be, uh, that's re replaced from the spare that is carried on the ship. The issue now arose that the gap was 90 kilometers. One of the features of cable 
maintenance is that you normally get only require about 15 kilometers of cable if you're doing a repair which is a pretty simple it's a simple repair um, in one point or in a short distance so the ship carries about 30 to 40 kilometers of cable which is specifically uh, spares for tonga obviously that wasn't going to be enough so it took some astute negotiation to uh, get the uh, cables from from others who were carried on the ship to do the uh, do the repair and so the new caledonia the spares for the new caledonia cable and the spare some spares from the southern cross cable were were acquired and uh jointed together to create a length that was sufficient to do the 90 kilometers of cable coupled with the insertion of a new repeater and so that was done and that but that took quite some while and and that was completed on let me, that was completed on um, the 21st of February. Um, so just over a month, month from when the, when the explosion occurred. And uh, so the repaired section there you can see is uh, some 90 kilometers um, in the cable. The ship after it had completed the, the repair of the Tonga Fiji cable, then went to investigate the domestic cable um, and found that the, the break there was about 110 kilometres. Unfortunately, there's very few domestic cables around the Pacific and there was not enough spare on the, on the ship to do the repair. So unfortunately, that cable has not yet been repaired and won't be repaired until the, the new cable is manufactured and, uh, and uh, brought out to uh, Tonga and then the ship's called down to relay it. And so that could be many, many months away, I think at least I'd say six months to nine months, it could be that that leg is out. So basically that's, um, that's really what, what happened. Um, here's the timeline that we can see and it starts at the 15th of January and finishes on the 28th of February when the ship left after investigating the domestic cable. Um, so 52 days altogether, including transit. So the, a very expensive repair. Um, and of course, there is also the cost of replacing the spare and the international cable, replacing the repeater to restock the spares and manufacturing the, the cable for the domestic thing. So they're all added costs that will go into the system. So, but in the end, it was a very successful operation and it restored the, the full cable communications for the international cable communications to to Tonga. Finally, I've got a place just north of Sydney um, at the beach. And um, back in a, uh, end of March, beginning of April, I went down to the beach and here littered on the beach was pumice. All, uh, and there's some examples of it. It was just all over the beach and clearly floating in. And there was no question that this all came from Tonga across the uh, currents from, from from Tonga across the waves to, to the east coast of Australia. So um, it's interesting to, to, to see that. And I guess not too many people realize why it was there, but uh, certainly I did. So thank you very much. And back to you. Uh, well, I'll hand over to John Turnbull if that's- uh, Yeah, yes. Yes, uh, John, thank you very much. Uh, that, that's uh, very interesting. And, and your uh, pumice samples indicate how widespread uh, this was. Um, now, uh, John Hibbard is uh, going to uh, finish with um, uh, some uh, details of the cable John replacement. Turner. So, John, over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to make sure you can see my screen. Excellent. I think you can. John, just not yet in for me. John Hibbard. Yep, you can see my screen. Excellent. Thank you. You're on mute. So thank you, everyone. And, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you about the, uh, the Tongan disaster. Um, my, my presentation will be very short. Um, while satellite and cable sometimes are, 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 are spoken about as competitive technologies, in this case, we often complement each other. Uh, myself, I've had a long association with John and Paul. We work together to ensure that we can try and get the best service for our Pacific nations that are close to us as we can. 
So just a little bit about uh, SES. Okay, and, and DigiSelf. So we worked with DigiSelf this case. So basically you've heard a lot about Tonga, uh, a nation in the Pacific, uh, a number of islands, most of them are uninhabited. The main island is obviously Tonga Tapu, where most of the, the residents uh, uh, live, but there's also a couple of major islands called Papai and Vavau, uh, which were also impacted by this, as well as some of the small islands, Nui's and so on. Um, currently on the cable, they have approximately six gigabits of capacity. So since the uptake of fibre to the nation several years ago, the uptake, uptake of broadband has been significant. So the, to have the cable cut, it causes quite a... Um, quite an impact to the nation. Digicel operate uh, throughout the world, but also particularly in a number of nations in the Pacific, Tonga being one of them, Fiji, Papua New Guinea, Nauru, uh, Vanuatu, and Samoa being the others. And they're in, in Tonga, they're one of the two mobile operators there. SES, satellites, uh, we're a global satellite provider and we operate satellites in two orbits. One is called geostationary orbit, which is 36,000 kilometers in the sky. And the other uh, orbit is called MEO, or medium Earth orbit, which is called the O3B constellation. We've got a long history of providing um, multi-orbit capacity in the Pacific. We've provided services to over 14 nations and states throughout the Pacific. The bulk of that though, has been on our medium Earth orbit constellation or O3B. The reason for that is that it has a lower latency and we can get much more capacity through those satellites. And we've been working with Digicel in the Pacific since 2014. They went live in Samoa and, um, and Papua New Guinea and Nauru early on in the, in the our phase of developing the O3B constellation in the Pacific. So what was the problem? Well, as you've heard, you know, on the 15th of January, um, the large volcano erupted and that caused all sorts of uh, dramas. And I can tell you exactly where I was. Um, just as Australia had wrapped up the last test in Hobart, um, I started to see some chatter online and also from internally at SES and then also from Digicel. Digicel was lucky that the, the, the CTO for the region is based in Fiji. He knew that the comms had been lost for some reason and started to talk to us about some type of resiliency options for the nation. He wasn't quite sure what was happening but soon it became quite apparent with the video that we saw online on Tsunami. Um, just some facts here, it's likely the biggest event that we've seen um, on the planet for 30 years. And as you can see from that satellite image, it's immense. Um, the eruption and tsunami, as you've heard from uh, the, the team before, caused significant damage on Tonga. And I, I, that's the first time I've seen that, and it's quite significant. Um, it caused a break in the main international cable, um, which connected Tongatapu to the rest of the world. But as John also said, it also impacted the domestic cable, which connected uh, Hapai and Vavau. And communication to the rest of the, the rest of the country was cut off, obviously because of that. In Tongatapu, uh, there was there was the ability to make phone calls and and texts. Um, Hapai and Vavau, they were unable to because that had cut the connection from Tapu to those islands. It uh, basically meant that there was no internet surfing and there was significant inability to communicate. And I think that caused some of the, the major issues that we've, we've seen. We talk about the business impact, the business impact uh, we saw was around $90 million. But for this one, one of the key things I saw was the social impact with so many relatives in, in New Zealand and Australia not being able to contact their loved ones there. I, I think that was the main thing that I saw was that the, the people were unable to find out what was happening and what, 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 what was happening with their loved ones. So we worked immediately. Um, we uh, made capacity on our geostationary um, network um, available for Digicel straight away. So what that basically meant was that they weren't, uh, no, none of the carriers on in Tonga were ready for this. Um, and what would happen is that they have the equipment, but not, it's not activated for it to work. So we activated our capacity straight away. It was available for Digicel. We're using C-band, which is good, robust technology, but it's from the geostationary orbit. So it, 
it's limited in the amount of throughput that you can do, and it requires some large, significant um, ground infrastructure for it to work. Some of the challenges we saw at the start were, as you can see from the images, the, the, a number of the staff members first were going to check on their families. And that's completely understandable um, because, you know, there was a tsunami, there was, we wanted, they needed to see and make sure that their family were okay. The only thing available at the time was sat satellite phones and um, given the size of those things and how they operate normally, they're often patchy sometimes anyway. And as some people have alluded to, there was some ash in the air and this was impacting uh, the use of those sat phones. And now what would happen is the team in Tonga were supported by the team in Fiji and also the SES team to get the ground equipment up to a, a status where it could be operating. Often these phones would cut in, cut out. They also had to clean up, uh, obviously, the ground equipment, get the electronics working so that they could use this capacity that uh, we at SES uh, were working with them to deliver for them. In the end, they used their nine metre of station in Fiji that they have to service a number of nations in the Pacific for just such events and also for some internal comms. And they have a 9.3 metre antenna in Tonga which allowed them to push the capacity out of Tonga. In the end, we delivered 136.5 megahertz of capacity, which is a, an element of spectrum which can then be converted with a ground equipment and electronics to convert those to megabits. So in the end, we were able to provide 126 by 63. Um, now that doesn't sound a lot when the, the, uh, the nation itself uh, had six gigabits, but what this did allow, it did allow international calls, it did allow international texts, and it also did allow some connectivity for the key government emergency departments who were addressing, and the support agencies that were addressing this disaster in Tonga. We also did fire up a smaller antenna that allowed some additional capacity to be delivered to the nation. So what happened was that uh, because uh, none of the carriers are ready, but we did get the capacity available already. And FujiSil does have equipment in country, is that the first calls were, were able to be restored by FujiSil and the text and some of the connectivity for those government agencies were there. What we continue to do with FujiSil though, is we continue to provide capacity for the connectivity to the outer islands. Um, as John has alluded, the domestic cable is still broken. Digicel have a microwave connection out to, uh, from Tonga Tapu to those outer, outer islands and the SES capacity, geostationary capacity is there to supplement that and to support that if that uh, microwave link has an issue. So some of the key learnings we took from this is um, it, it was probably a disjointed approach. We did try and contact the Tonga Cable Company and TCC, which is the local carrier, but of course, connectivity was an issue, you couldn't get through to them. And in this case, and this is the second time an earthquake has impacted Tonga in three years, there was no preparations for, for a, a, what we would call a hot cutover. And a hot cutover is equipment ready with capacity to, to perform in the event of a, such, a, such an emergency. And Tonga, unlike other Pacific nations, doesn't have an O3B terminal or a medium earth orbit terminal. In that case, if there was one of those terminals available, we could theoretically have landed 1.2 gigabits of capacity, which would have been more than the 200 or so megabits that we did provide. That would have allowed uh, more than just the government agencies, uh, but also uh, people in Tonga to communicate uh, via the web to the outside world. Um, so that is pretty much what I need to say. And I would be happy to field any questions on this event and what went on. Um, so back to you guys. Uh, John, uh, thank you very much. Uh, that was uh, uh, very, very interesting indeed. And, and um, it was an indication of, of how um, people who knew what they were doing Came, came together to aid the people of uh, Tonga immediately following the disaster and uh, restored communications um, in, in, to enable um, uh, things to happen there. We'll now move to the, um, the questions and, and answers. Um, our speakers have been um, 
uh, responding to some of the questions, but we'll, we'll, we might address those anyway. Um, I'll start with a, a question from uh, Marlene Kanga, which is addressed to um, uh, Rashman and uh, James. Um, and, and I thank Marlene who has uh, posted in the chat box uh, some um, uh, links to some um, very relevant uh, information uh, on the, uh, the matter of uh, response to disasters. So thank you, Marlene. Uh, the uh, question that she, Marlene poses, uh, perhaps to James, is are the vulnerability factors, fragility functions, et cetera, that were used in the damage assessments available these would be useful in damage assessment modelling in other parts of the world. The impacts of ashfall on infrastructure, such as water and sewage networks, including treatment plants, would be very valuable. So the, you might uh, care to respond to that question. Yeah, no worries. And uh, thanks, Marlene, for the question. So within GRADE, what we have is we we do use the vulnerability functions right at the start of the analysis, but as more and more information comes in, uh, we then calibrate these functions or even do, um, or even remove the vulnerability function when we have the damage to particular structures um, from the event. So although we start off with vulnerability functions and there are many around the world, and of course I can send you, um, I can send you the starting functions that we use in a lot of different cases. These are from people like Susanna Jenkins, um, uh, GNS Science. There's a, again, many, many different studies that are done all around the world. But what we do is that we then calibrate it based on what we're seeing on the ground. Um, and, and then this ad adjusts for each particular sector because each, event for a singular event, um, this can be very, very different to a, to a vulnerability function. So depending on what is actually happening, um, we then calibrate on damage reports, on satellite data, social media data of, of what we're seeing um, from the particular structures. Um, whereas vulnerability functions in general are built from me, um, many, many past events which are then calibrated generally to the, to the mean of what you, what you see. Whereas say in this event, um, the, the ash fall was, uh, had a high salt content. It wasn't as acidic as, um, as some um, volcanic ash around the place. And this then would be very, very different. We couldn't just use a, a vulnerability function from Guatemala. Um, and, and so um, it, it was quite interesting seeing that uh, at least G uh, we had a collaboration with GNS uh, science, or we were talking with GNS Science as well at the time, and they were doing a lot of a lot of studies on this uh, chemical makeup of the ash because this affected then that agricultural damage as well as other as as well as other issues. So yeah, no, I can definitely send you um, various um, various functions, um, but again, in grade, what we do is we really do then adjust it to to remove as much as possible of this uh, estimation approach and try to get the damage from the ground as as close as possible. Uh, maybe thank, thank you, James. Rashman, did you wish to add to that? Yeah, j just a, a couple of points. One, there are uh, kind of open uh, risk models. For example, uh, in New Zealand, there's Riskade that actually has, a, for example, a volcano specific module that, that actually could be useful. And uh, this also refers to some of my earlier points on capacity building as well. So in the small island states, the regional DRM agencies actually are developing these types of information, but they're also developing a repository of uh, kind of also this type of inf information in terms of uh, exposure, but also in terms of um, volcano uh, vulnerability functions. For example, there's PACRIS, uh, which is the regional database that actually uh, develops and uh, keeps a record of these types of information as well. Thanks. Yes. Sorry, I'll just add one more comment to that. There's also the, of course, the ADB study that was done in Togotapu as well. Good, uh, thank you very much. Um, that does uh, raise a point you might comment on briefly, Rashman, I think, think you're alluding to this. The, the grade type principles, uh, could well be effectively uh, rolled out to countries in the Pacific uh, so that the, they could be, um, uh, the, the countries themselves uh, could be ahead of the curve 
uh, knowing that uh, there, there is the um, increasing risk of uh, disasters. Is that a proposal that the bank has to um, build capacity in that respect? Exactly, exactly. So actually just before this call or, or um, presentation, I was on a, a conference call with um, the Pacific community uh, at SPC, um, and that's exactly what they actually are trying to do. So the World Bank works not only with the countries themselves at the national level, but also at the regional level um, in developing this kind of capacity. Tonga itself, the government actually wants to be better prepared. So they want to know what type of information, both in terms of hazard, but also exposure, can they already pre-prepare so that in the next event, because as James mentioned, uh, Cyclone Gita was back in 2018 and then Cyclone Harold 2020, and we have the volcanic eruption in 2022, right? So three big events in the space of four years. So if you are looking at that type of frequency, they need to be better prepared. So the national governments, as well as the regional governments do want to develop the capacity within the, within their organizations to, to dis, do this rapid type of assessment. Thanks. Thank you, Rashman. Uh, we have a question uh, to uh, John Hibbard from uh, Peter Thornton. Uh, uh, Peter asks, <clears throat> are all the cables uh, are exactly the same specification? I, I picked up on that point that um, uh, the cables were that, that were being held for spare in, in uh, another location were brought uh, on the site because of the length involved uh, in, in the repair in this case. So Peter asks, are they of the same specification? And if not, what impact on capacity and performance occurs if you have to splice in a cable meant for another route? Oh, thank John? you, Dick. Yeah. Yeah, no trouble. Um, and thank you for your question, Peter. Uh, basically, the, the cables in the, in the Pacific, the majority of the cables have been provided and supplied by Alcatel, who's done most of the work, although, and that makes for a, a simpler interconnection because of the same, same similar type of cable. In the case of the New Caledonia cable, which they borrowed, um, that's exactly the same specification as the uh, as the cable that is a spare for Tonga. So that was easily jointed and there's a standard jointing kits that the ships carry um, to joint those. Um, in the case of the, the other cable that they took for Southern Cross, it has more fibre pairs in it, but they only jointed the necessary one fibre pair that the Tonga cable is. Um, they also um, borrowed because they didn't have enough jointing kits on the ship um, uh, that were associated with the that are owned by Tong, owned in inverted commas by Tonga. Um, they borrowed those actually from the Vanuatu, the guys on the Vanuatu cable, their spares. They used some of their kits. So it was a really a team effort to bring them together. As to the impact, in this case, the fiber fibers are basically identical in all the cases. So therefore, apart from the, 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 the 0.3 of a dB you lose with your joints, um, by and large, there's no very minimal impact. Also, this being a short cable, it's very forgiving in the sense that if you lost had had Im impairments, you can compensate. Had it been a very much longer cable, then you start to get worry about uh, what the consequences are for uh, from uh, multiple joints and um, and any slight deviations in the in the characteristics of the cable. But overall, um, no no impact on the capacity and no impact on the performance that would be noticeable from uh, any, any user of the cable. And, uh, and so fortunately we were able to, in the event that we um, had to use um, someone else's cable, like a subcom cable to joint to an Alcatel cable, um, there, are, there are universal jointing kits for doing that. And though the ships carry those, um, the specifications can be slightly different, but there's amazingly similar, amazing similarity between them. And so therefore, in this sort of situation, it would not have made any difference, but it wasn't the case anyway, because they could use Alcatel cables for all of them. I think that answers the question, Dick. Yes, it does, John, and thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, a slight follow-up question though. The, the, it seemed to me that the cable repairs uh, and the, the 
reinstatement of communications or <coughs> satellite links were heroic engineering and a, and a credit to the people involved uh, who were showing innovation to get there. But was I reading it correctly? It, it is slightly ad hoc and, and is there a need or is there actually in place a, um, a very comprehensive risk management plan uh, that would um, uh, ensure that uh, this type of thing uh, can reliably be um, reinstated, the communications can reliably be reinstated? I think uh, John Turnbull's probably better to answer that. Because okay, it, John. Um... Yeah, sure. So um, a couple of the things that uh, are, are happening. So from the key learnings, we're working closely with Digicel, which is now um, a Telstra entity, to look at a resiliency plan for the Pacific markets that, uh, that they are in. Um, a high resiliency plan for those nations where there isn't, isn't diverse cable. And some nations are lucky and they have that, most nations are not. Um, I've also made that plan available to those other nations where, where Digicel is not uh, uh, a entity so that uh, in the event of an outage as significant as this, that they would have some coverage using the over EV solution, right? Which is the, the ability to get a lot of throughput through um, very quickly with the same similar latency to what they were getting on their cable so that their, their economy and the social impact, the ability to communicate with their loved ones, is not as great as this one was. Um, we're also working with the Australian government. I note that there's an, a, a question about uh, working in what support has the Australian government done here. We also worked with DFAT on this very case. We did have an over EV terminal in the US, which we could have shipped straight away. The issue or the, the uh, hindrance to that was the COVID situation. And um, what we needed to do was a no impacts uh, situation. And uh, we would have needed to get our people on the ground to, to do that install. But given COVID and the significant issues there, we were unable to do so. So the Australian government had uh, all good intentions to do so. They were working very closely with us to do that. And, um, but unfortunately, we couldn't quite get that one there because of the, um, the impact of getting people on the ground. Just to add to uh, what John's saying, um, standard practice in the, for most countries where they've got one um, submarine cable only um, is to restore um, a, about 10 to 15 percent on sat satellite because that was enough to basically sustain um, the governments, the airlines, the banks. Um, but if you're on Facebook or YouTube, tough luck, you, you, you go away. But it's basically there designed to, uh, to provide the essential communications. And so therefore, uh, a rule of thumb is about 10 percent is kept on satellite when you've got one cable because by and large, the backup is hardly ever used, is hardly being used. It might carry a little trickle of traffic to make sure it's working, but by and large, it's not used and therefore it's an expense and hence an expense that uh, is tries to be, companies try to minimise and so 10% is the, the rule of thumb. Obviously, if you've got another cable, um, then you're ready to do 100% restoration and uh, countries like Samoa, Fiji, they've got, they've got full backup. Uh, new Caledonia is putting in a new cable to right at this moment to get its second cable for a full backup. Uh, Vanuatu has plans to, but hasn't proceeded with the uh, with a, its its second cable. Um, and so, and and Tonga, um, there are currently no firm plans for any second cable, um, and they are going to be relying on satellite for their for their backup. Thank you, John, and thank you, John. Uh, we have a. Peter Thornton has also posed a question to uh, Rashman and James. He, uh, Peter asks, um, uh, have you benchmarked the outturn costs of actual recovery, restoration, reconstruction uh, in, in uh, past cases against those estimates predicted by grade for previous, yes, relating the previous disasters to, uh, to, to check on, uh, on what grade is um, producing. So could you respond to Peter? Thank you, either J Rashman or James. 
have you benchmarked the outturn costs? Freshman, maybe you can start and then I'll, I'll add to. So it, it is something that, uh, and it's a great question. Peter. So what, one of the key things that we're actually trying to do is look at the, the benchmarking itself as part of grade. I think James explained this particular part, but also looking at some of the uh, come damage and loss databases that have been created or the pool size of damage and lease assessments that have been created uh, for a lot of the past events in the last um, 15 years or so. So this is actually very important because you might be surprised that up till now there has not been a consistent economic based damage and loss database that, that's uh, available for not only for volcanic eruption induced um, um, impacts or disasters, but for other disasters as well. So that is very important for the benchmarking side of the aspect as well. But also when you're, for example, looking from a climate perspective, when you're looking at what the potential future impacts would be, considering that the, uh, the frequency and severity of these events actually might change. Thanks. And it's also extremely important to look at the definitions because we we de define it as capital damages for our grade assessment. That's all that can be done in that first two week period. Um, whereas there's also a huge amount of losses. So indirect, intangible supply chain effects that go on um, from disasters. And this is only what can be estimated after two, three, five, or even years down the track. Um, and so it's extremely important to, to, to sort of look at the definition of these damages as well. When we've benchmarked it, we're generally within 90% accuracy of, of any assessment which comes out after the event. So it's, it's uh, obviously this two week period is about the right time to get at a decent estimate. Um, but most important is we define replacement costs. So this is replacing the, the structures to their, to their original standard, of course, of course new, but original standard. It isn't looking at reconstruction of these assets. This could be because we've got, well, we have new energy standards. We may have new disaster codes that we need to adhere to because you know, the disaster is impacted um, and we want to build back better. And so that reconstruction cost can often be many times the replacement cost of, the, of those original assets. And so this is, again, another thing which is, is done down the track with these long, longer range studies rather than grade. Grade gives that sort of that damage uh, estimate, um, which is useful, of course, for many things as well. And Dick, just to uh, add to that in regard to the submarine cable, um, the submarine cable was out, uh, the ship was redeployed for 52 days and uh, typically at the current fuel rates um, and the deal that is done for the, the maintenance agreement, it would be about $30,000 a day, um, US dollars. So that's, that's about $1.5 million. Um, the cable is about $8,000 a kilometre and 90 ki kilometres, so that's about 700,000. The repeat is about 300,000. So that's about another million. So there's 2.5 million and we haven't, we haven't got to the replant air of the domestic cable yet. So um, that, that will have to be procured and the, the ship will have to be brought out again. And there's another, well, you know, depending where it's coming from, uh, you know, at least uh, uh, two weeks of, of ship time. And so altogether, you, you talk, you're going to be talking about three to, three to $4 million. And I think your, your figure in your chart of 3.4 seemed to be you know, quite, quite, close to the mark. Thank, thank you. Yeah, we tried to we tried to estimate based on exactly these types of parameters and thank you. Yeah, so um, yeah, again, it's uh, it's always difficult though, again, with this two week period, but often towards the end of the two week period, we can get some sort of clarity. Uh, thanks, John, that's really yeah. good to hear as well. <laughs> so that's uh, very good information to feed back to Rashman and James uh, there. Uh, so uh, we, we have a question from uh, Siam Siddiq, Siam Siddiq uh, who is with the Tsunami Disaster Mitigation Research Centre in Indonesia. And, uh, and he asks, uh, is any, can anyone explain how the social economic recovery is performed in Tonga? Um, I, I guess uh, referring to um, who will be um, managing the recovery and who will be paying for it. And um, the second question, any impact of the tsunami to the tsunami early warning system on Pacific Islands? 
uh, and and is there feedback into that warning system? Okay, James and Rashman, can you? Sure, thanks. Uh, it's it's a great question. No, so in terms of the recovery framework, that is something the government itself is actually working on. So what you would normally have a disaster response plan that actually moves into a uh, recovery framework. And then you go into kind of a reconstruction side. In this case, the ministries of finance is actually leading the engagement in this, uh, developing the uh, recovery framework. They were using some of the impacts or, or the assessment from grade to inform the response plan that then feed in into the recovery framework itself. Given the kind of the complexity on the ground and they actually are using the information from the different line ministries as well. This is actually taking some time, but that process is currently ongoing as I actually currently understand. In terms of the socioeconomic impact, this is actually critical because one of the key things the government would also want to do was provide some of the subsidies for the most vulnerable as well. And to determine how much you need to give they actually also want to need the magnitude of the, of the particular event as well. But in addition to that, the sectoral impact, for example, James talked about the impact of the tourism sector. That's important as well in determining what the consequences actually are going to be down the line as well. So hopefully that provides you a, a, a kind of a broad answer. I'm not quite sure exactly what it is the current state of it as now, but when we actually did the assessment that those were the kind of the discussions we had with the, with, with the government as well. But I know um, some of the other IFIs, but also the donor coordination is also supporting these types of efforts as well, in, in terms of poverty assessment, as well as social vulnerability and social protection. Thanks. James, you want to elaborate on some of it? Uh, okay. Th thank you. Thank you, Rashman. Uh, the, um, that then, and perhaps picks up on a question posed by Mike Duro. What support has the Australian government provided apart from the warship based activities? Uh, I think John Turnbull did uh, refer to um, something that was looked into, um, but uh, is the Australian government um, uh, present to assist uh, Tonga in, in the ongoing? Uh, uh, rehabilitation. I think that's for James. I said my piece, James. Uh, I, I oh, can... I'll have to rush him in then. Rashman, we have an election on in Australia at the moment, so perhaps we should ask the, the current minister and, and the shadow minister. <laughs> What they it's a intend very good to do. Sounds a good plan, Dick. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But but uh, the, I know the international community and DFAT were actually organizing, you know, so there was a lot of contribution from them. Um, as you probably know, for major disasters, there is a, a donor coordination that actually goes on. So it's not only just DFAT, but also from the New Zealand, from, from the UN agencies come together to determine the amount of resources that actually are needed to do this type of assessment. And, and that's also where, for example, the grid um, uh, work actually fed into actually for uh, providing information for, 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 um, uh, for the donor coordination as well. With, with DFAT itself, it was actually very useful to have some of the, uh, some, the information coming through. Uh, it was actually much more uh, in terms of remote sensing imagery, but also some of the other data sets that, that uh, were actually provided as well. So um, but it was also in coordination, for example, with the New Zealand Air Defence as well, or Defence Force, they, they also provided a lot of the information as well. Thanks. Thank you, Rashman. Uh, we have a question from uh, Bob McCotter. Um, he poses to James, I was surprised that the impact on agriculture was mainly from ash rather than soil con contamination from the salt water uh, following the tsunami. Was the main ash impact from blanketing or acidity? Uh, very, very good question, Bob. Um, so it's both correct in a way. The damage, the damage itself is it was mostly due to the ash fall because again, this is the damage, and this was mostly on Tonga due to the newly um, the, 
the newly planted crops. So a lot of the, the crops are quite resistant on Tonga. So pandanus, sandalwood, uh, banana farms and whatever, they're quite resistant, um, especially to this type of ash fall as well. But we, it, was the new, it was the new crops, the ulfi, the um, sweet potato, um, the maniocs, uh, yams, leafy vegetables, and also watermelons. Um, that we saw um, sort of a lot of a lot of sort of the the damage occurring. Now, as we get through to the losses, so obviously they're going to replant crops, and this is where saltwater contamination is uh, starts to be an issue because as you get into the losses side of things, so as you get into that next crop cycle, um, then then this could form the problem that you know we, the, the crop may may fail um, due to saltwater contamination. Um, of course, there was also damage on the western coast and also those tsunami impacted um, locations that did strip uh, certain trees out. Um, and so uh, there you did have uh, direct uh, agricultural damages, but really it's those losses in that next crop cycle, which will be from that saltwater contamination. Um, and so I don't think we'll see it from the ash, the ash fall. I think the ash fall itself, um, again, the ash makeup probably won't affect that next crop cycle as much. Um, it will be more so um, on that saltwater contamination side. But again, this is something that hopefully would come from, from another assessment long-term. Uh, I know that there are, uh, there's the, the Mordi group, which does quite a lot of uh, work on agriculture there in Tonga, uh, especially in the rural communities. And, and I know that they are looking at certain things like this um, to see how this is going to be impacted. So hopefully there will be some studies on, on at least that saltwater contamination. Yep. So I think it might be good to explain. So we also collaborated with some of the academic institutions oh, yeah. as well, right? You know, so in, in actually exactly talking about this particular point and some of the modeling work that they themselves were doing at the time. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So we had a sort of a working group where we were meeting with um, with, with uh, various uh, various universities in New Zealand, uh, in Canterbury, um, as well as then GNS Science, as well as then Susanna Jenkins and a few other people around uh, around the world who have dealt with a lot of volcanic eruptions in the past and tsunamis. Um, talking really about this point of agriculture, because this was one of the most difficult parts of the assessment to try and work out what was actually happening and, and why the agricultural damages were significantly lower than what we would have expected. They were still, of course, high for Tonga standards, but, um, but they were quite low um, compared to other places in the world that we've done assessments. Thank you very much, James. And, um... And Rashman, um, I think we've got time for one uh, short uh, question. Uh, the, uh, there is mention in the, um, the grade report of uh, climate change, although this particular disaster uh, was not related to climate change. The previous disasters that you are referring to, the cyclone uh, Gita uh, and, uh, and Harold were, uh, is there, um, an intention to price in, to price in and, and make mandatory the need to build back better to resist um, the impacts of climate change and uh, the, the natural disasters so that the, uh, the country is better equipped. Uh, thanks, Richard. So in, in terms of build back better, it's not necessary for the climate induced impacts. No, it's for, for example, in Tonga's case, it's also the earthquake side of it as well. So of course, the World Bank um, does provide a lot of encouragement and support. It looks at, for example, building regulations and resilience work that looks at um, the, uh, the kind of activities related to building back better as well. And and, and this is sometimes not necessarily just on natural disasters or, or natural hazards, but it could, for example, relate to kind of uh, man-made catastrophes, for example, in Lebanon related to the, the, the explosion itself. So there is, of course, the World Bank is actually looking because uh, a lot of the mandate within the World Bank also focus on resilience, right? And resilience is the ability to kind of bounce back faster and better. And the key component of that actually is building more resilient structures. But it's also going beyond that. So it is not just looking at building back better, but also looking at more sustainable and green infrastructure as well. 
So for example, nature-based solutions are also a key part of what we're actually doing. And this also sits within the wider framework, for example, the sustainable development goals as well. Hope that helps. Thanks. I think there's a fine isn't there for that for my the um, muting. Uh, we've come to the end of our time, and I before I thank our speakers, uh, I'd like to uh, bring uh, attention to some upcoming events. Uh, we have um, the uh, the Humanitarian Innovation Awards are now open. Uh, the hackathon is on the 22nd, 24th of July. This is uh, run by the um, uh, the Warren Centre Humanitarian Innovation Awards, the Ron Johnson Awards, and it's open to undergraduates throughout Australia. And uh, I strongly recommend that. It's a, a very valuable and uh, worthwhile pursuit for um, undergraduates who have an inter interest in humanitarian work. And the next item on the forthcoming events is um, safeguards. Um, our lives depend upon them, or well, not our lives, but lives do depend upon them, uh, which is will be conducted by the Hub uh, as a webinar on the 8th of June as a uh, panel event uh, with some uh, very notable uh, uh, speakers uh, uh, going to be present. And I think that will be worthwhile. Anyone who works in uh, humanitarian engineering will know the importance of, uh, of uh, environmental and social safeguards. Inc incidentally, the, the image there, I realise, is a school in Tonga, uh, which was not damaged, fortunately, by the in the recent event. Uh, so um, uh, finally, it is my pleasure to thank the uh, four speakers. Um, uh, Rashman Gunasukara, James Daniel, John Hibbard, and John Turnbull, uh, all most eminent, quite obviously, in their fields. So the Hub is um, very pleased that we were able to uh, have them uh, join with us today. I think their um, presentations have, and their response to questions have been um, uh, most informative and, and in fact, uh, a fascinating coverage uh, of uh, what was a uh, very serious event uh, and, uh, and the, the work that was done uh, in the fields that they've spoken about certainly uh, alleviated uh, the, the problems and challenges for the people of Tonga. Uh, and I believe you'll agree with me that it's been a first class presentation on what was a real and unprecedented, quoting the Prime Minister, natural disaster for the people of Tonga. And on behalf of the Warren Centre uh, Hub, I thank you all.